I want to thank you guys for taking your lunch time to listen to me talk about boring stress, right? Because honestly, raise your hand if you're excited about the topic of stress. <laughs> when, when they said, we're going to have you guys come and talk about stress, I was like overly joyed. <laughs> because let's be honest though, who doesn't deal with stress? Yeah, so nobody's hands are up, so we all deal with stress. So what's the deal with stress? How does that affect our body? How does that have a profound influence on our health? What are most people's solution when we deal with stress? Like what's your, so, your strategy or your plan on how you go about dealing with stress on a day in doubt basis? This is how most people deal with stress. And I think it's actually kind of effective, isn't it? Yeah, no? Um, so it says bang head here, directions. You just put that on a firm surface. You could use the, the table front in front of you and just Smack your head right on the desk there, and that's a great way to cope with stress. No, I'm just kidding. So I like starting with that, though, because um, stress is like one of these things where it really affects everybody, but there aren't, like, unless you're really cognizant and aware of it, um, stress is one of those things that slowly creeps up on you. And it's very similar to how disease happens in the body. A lot of times, disease slowly creeps up on you, and then all of a sudden you have symptoms, and this disease is manifesting itself in the body, and we think it's just this short-term thing that just started when in all actuality, it began a long, long time ago. And so what I want to do is I want to take a couple of minutes and just talk to you guys about what the stress response looks like in your body. How does your body actually process stress um, on a neurological level and on a chemical and hormonal level? Like what systems actually take effect in the body when you are exposed to stress? First of all, what... Um, what would you guys, how would you guys classify stress? What would be the, the three most common forms of stress if you had to classify them? I'm gonna ask you lots of questions, so I'll just keep talking until somebody shouts something out. Personal. What was that? Personal stress? Like business stress? Personal? Business stress, okay. So maybe in like different categories of your life. Um, what I'm kind of thinking more towards is gonna be chemical stress, mm -hmm. emotional stress, and then physical stress. So the physical stress would be like the actual assaults physically on your body that stress has. For instance, if you exercise all the time, it puts physical stress on the joints in your body. Fair? Then you've got chemical stress, and chemical stress would be the type of stress where there is a biochemical change in your body. It could be from always eating really, really bad trans fats. It can create a chemical, uh, chemical stressor in your body that thus has an effect. And then the third type of stress is going to be the emotional stress. And I think emotional stress is the one that most people really deal with. Um, and a lot of us learn to just kind of cope with it and like live with it without really actually addressing it. And I think it has the biggest effect on most people. Chronic stress, if we're looking at it, um, I put this up here because it's fun. I always love funny little, little things like this. He's saying, I'm not a lazy bum, I'm just a potential workaholic with really, really highly developed stress management skills. <laughs> because I could really go do what I know I'm supposed to do that's going to help me get rid of the stress, but instead I'm just going to sit here and be lazy and I'm going to continue to deal with the stress. Um, so the implications of chronic stress, like how does it actually affect our body? What are the health implications of you continually on a day in, day out basis deal with stress, chemical, emotional, physical stress in the body. Well, a lot of the common diseases that America is suffering with all have stress as the underlying root. And I always think this is funny because when, we're, when, I'm, when I'm teaching patients like what real health is in our office, um, one of the things I, I always ask are well, like, what are the top causes of death in America? What are the diseases that are affecting most Americans? And we'll go through it and we'll talk about cancer and heart disease. Um, they're very, very serious diseases. And I always ask this, like, we have the, the person who raises their hand, they'll be like, well, stress. Stress is the number one killer. And I laugh about it, though, because I'm like, well, not really. Like, if you went to the graveyard and you looked at the gravestones and everybody's gravestone technically could say, like, died from stress, if you really think about it, because stress causes all sorts of effects in the body. And I was having trouble really, like, honing in on what exactly do I want to teach you guys about stress when I was told stress was gonna be the topic because it affects literally every part of your body when you really start to study it. So some of the diseases though that it can create in the body are heart disease, 
Hair loss, this is an interesting one because here I stand before you, a young, healthy doctor, and I've got no hair on my body. And a lot of you guys are probably thinking, like when you first saw me, that first impression, what's up with that? I have no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no body hair whatsoever, and it's all because of how my body responded to chronic stress. And I kid you not, when I was three years old, I had a really, really bad um, allergy reaction. My mom didn't know what it was, and she freaked out because mom loves me, so she took me to the hospital to save me. Because the allergic reaction was so bad, I had this really severe um, asthma attack, and it started to close up my airways. So when she took me to the hospital, they EpiPen me, and they got the allergic reaction under control, and then they um, got the breathing under control. So thank God for that, because here I am. I'm alive today speaking before you, but the problem with it is for the next 14 years of my life, nobody ever really addressed the underlying cause of the problem. I ended up on medications, two asthma inhalers, two allergy medications, a nasal spray, all prescription grade, and then by the time I was 13, the allergies continued getting worse and worse and worse to the point where they wanted to do allergy shots in my arms. And that was uh, purported to me as being the solution for this. So they did two shots in the left arm, one in the right, and I did it one time a week for four years. And then finally my body got to the point where it had so much chemical stress, toxicity, that it triggered an immune response and my immune system is like hyperactive. I always tell people I have Superman's immune system because my immune system attacks my hair and it falls out. So I grow hair, it just doesn't stay. And that's just a, like, it's maybe an extreme example of what stress can do in your body, but every day I look in the mirror, it's a constant reminder though that people deal with stress every single day and maybe we aren't um, coping with it in the most effective manner. Now the stress that I was dealing with was specifically neurological stress, um, or at least the effect was on my nervous system. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that, but we're gonna go ahead and move forward. And we're going to talk about what exactly is the stress response in the body. So, I want you to forget about everything that's in front of you right now. Close your eyes. Imagine you're in the forest, okay? You're in the forest, and you're minding your own business, and you're camping with your best buddy. Maybe you're camping with your spouse and your family, and you got your tent, and everything's going great. It's fine and dandy, and then all of a sudden, grizzly bear comes out of nowhere. What happens when the grizzly, grizzly bear comes out of nowhere? You can open your eyes. I just wanted you to picture a really fierce grizzly bear with like the ferocious teeth. Who actually did that? Who pictured a teddy bear? <laughs> don't, don't lie, you pictured a teddy bear, didn't you? Okay. Well, okay, so grizzly bear, it pops out in front of you. What do you do? You're gonna run. You're gonna like try and run for your life and get to safety. You're gonna have an immediate response and you're not gonna think about it. Now, the response of stress, when you're introduced to some sort of stress Let's say it's a work deadline. You get a new project, and you better deliver on that project or you're fired. That's stress, right? Your body will respond in the same type of way. And basically what happens is it's this thing called gas. Stress creates gas in your body. Now, gas is an acronym, and it stands for General um, Adaptation Syndrome. So it's literally the biochemical uh, effect that your body goes through when you're introduced to stress. And the first stage of it is alarm or reaction stage. So when you're stressed, a very specific part of your nervous system, that's the wire system that runs everything in our body, it's called your sympathetic nerves, that kicks in and it creates a response called a fight or flight response. Now, when you were in school, if you remember back to anatomy and physiology class, when you were learning about the fight or flight response, a lot of times they teach you that's like extreme. Like if a bear was chasing me, certainly that system would kick in. But the reality is it kicks in every single day when you're, uh, when you're um, introduced to stress. So that fight or flight portion of your nervous system kicks in because it's your body's way of dealing with what it needs to in order to survive. Fair? Or I could say savvy. Savvy is my way of saying, it's like pirate terminology of saying, is that cool? Are you with me? Do you follow? Okay, so I'll say savvy a couple more times. So that's the first thing that happens. Your fight or flight kicks in. What does that mean? Well, all of the nerves that go to your internal organs, they kind of shut down because your body doesn't need to digest food to deal with stress, right? 
But what your body needs to do if the bear is chasing you is it needs to shunt blood to your muscles and it needs to, to basically divert all of its energy and all of its focus towards the emergency systems that are necessary to save you. Now that response happens every time you're introduced to stress. So like the things that a lot of people suffer from when they're under chronic stress end up being gaining weight, poor digestive function, you start getting aches and pains, really, really tired and fatigued. Now how does that happen? Well, it's because the second stage is your adaptation uh, phase. So after the part of your nervous system kicks in to fight or flight or to uh, save you, like you run from the bear, you need to run from the bear, you need blood to your muscles, you don't need to digest food. After that takes place, your body tries to balance it out. And the second phase for balancing it out is your adaptation phase. This is where you start to have the chemical factory that comes in. Now the chemical factory, this is your body's hormonal response. So when your work deadline is all of a sudden you look at your calendar and you look at the clock and you've got six hours because tomorrow that project is due and you're like, oh my God, I procrastinated, I didn't do it. After you get over that initial response, the next thing is your adaptation. Your body's gonna try and balance it out and smooth it out by kicking in the other system, which is your rest and digest system. When this happens, it creates a hormonal response that isn't necessarily the best thing for you long term. But short term, in the moment, it's good because it's what you need. Because if you were just wired up all the time like this, you would never get any work done and you'd be like shaking and you can't even write and, and focus on your, your work. So your body's gotta calm you down. When that happens and you continue to do this cycle over and over and over again, that's when you end up with problems. Because the long-term effect of it is fatigue, irritability, lethargy, um, and tiredness, and then the final stage, this is what ends up happening. Your body releases this hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is the hormone, a lot of people call it the aging hormone. Cortisol, basically what it does is it eats away at your lean muscle mass. It starts to age you faster because it does all these things. It raises your blood pressure. It affects how your body processes glucose and sugar. It literally will make it harder on a cellular level for your body to get sugar into the cells because it affects your insulin in the body and it will decrease your immunity as well. Because when this whole process happens, in order for your body to balance that alarm reaction and then adapt it, it, it um, basically will pull a lot of the energy and the focus through your nervous system away from immunity because you get stuck in this cycle so what am I trying to tell you? Chronic stress, this is what it does in the body. Nobody likes it. So are there really effective ways of maybe coping with the emotional stress that we deal with on a day in day out basis? Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of um, you guys probably already have strategies in place to help you deal with the chemical stress, like how you've been eating, your nutrition, your food, stuff like that. And then also the physical stress on how you give your body rest and you stretch, and you exercise, and you take care of your joints. But the emotional stress ends up being the one I think hits the people the hardest. So I wanna give you a couple of quick pointers that will help you deal with the emotional stress. First, let's just look at a couple of quotes I wanna share with you guys. Time is what we want most, but what we use worst. It's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? And then my favorite one is time equals life. So therefore, waste your time and waste your life. Or master your time, master your life. That was by uh, Alan Lichen. So I put these up here because in order to deal with the emotional stress in the most effective way, we have to take control of the one resource that we all have equally available to us. And what is that resource? Time. We all get 24 hours a day. How we choose to utilize that time is entirely up to us. And what creates most emotional stress for people is, I always think of um, my training with Tony Robbins, he says, all stress comes from people making things more important than they really are. Think about that. You sit there and you stress out about something 
87% of the time, the things you worry about never even happen. True. Never even happen. But you divert all this mental energy towards thinking about that one thing and making it so much more important. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, you know? Um, so what are we going to talk about here? Well, we're going to talk about time management. And I'm going to try and keep it very, very simple for you guys. So go ahead and get your uh, stopwatch out. It's a 36-hour stopwatch. This is going to take quite a bit. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so in order for us to really come up with a, an effective strategy with time, we're going to talk about how do we utilize our time based on how we prioritize things. Because everybody has done this at some point where you get back to, backlogged with work, and then your number one go-to strategy is I'm going to write everything I need to get done down, and I'm going to make a checklist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it. And then what happens to the checklist? Maybe you do it for a day and it helps you out and it actually is effective, but you just stop doing it. Because the checklist in and of itself isn't effective enough. You need a better type of checklist. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But when you don't have an effective strategy on how to prioritize what you're doing with your time, it ends up causing this to happen. You get put into a cradle. It's the cradle paradox. And the cradle paradox in wrestling, um, you were saying we're on the Wellness Advisory Council for the wrestling team, is really interesting. They talk about the cradle paradox all the time when it comes to mental training, when it comes to discipline, how they take care of their bodies, how they take care of their mindset, how they take care of their nutrition. Because the only way in wrestling to get out of a cradle is don't get into the cradle in the first place. So in wrestling, a cradle move is when you get put into a pin position like that, that's called a cradle. And for most people, if the cradle is done effectively, you can't get out of it. So the best way to get out of the cradle with your time is don't get caught where you don't have time to get the important things done that really matter to you. And then you end up with even more stress than you could ever imagine. Savvy? Mm -hmm. OK, so how are we going to do that? Well, there's this in psychology, there's this guy, Covey. Stephen Covey, he came up with what's called the four quadrants. Now, the four quadrants are a way that you can prioritize the things that you need to accomplish in your life based on importance and urgency. OK? Importance and urgency. So you can go online. You can Google Covey's quadrants. So with the quadrant, the quadrant is broken down into four different quadrants, which is why it's called a quadrant. Quad means four. Uh, anyway, what, the way that it's, it's broken down is in order of importance, going across the top column here. I mean the top row, and then not important on the bottom row. And then in the columns, you've got urgent and then not urgent. So when you make that checklist of all the things that you have to do, the problem is you have not prioritized what is urgent, what is important. right? So you haven't qualified that checklist. You've just made the checklist. And so in order to make it more effective for you, you really should qualify it. Now, if you were to go ahead and take your checklist and then put it into these categories, you'll find that most of the things that you do on a day-in, day-out basis are in categories one and three. They're urgent to you because you want to get them done, and you either tell, tell yourself, well, it's important, I need to do it right way, or it's not important, I can do it later. And so because of that, you only effectively ever get like one or two things done on a day-in, day-out basis that are super important to you, and then the rest get kind of put off. But you'll still get them done, maybe you'll just do it tomorrow. Does that make sense? Okay, so. What we need to do is we need to start prioritizing our categories and try and take more of the things that we find ourselves putting in category three into category two. Because the things that naturally fall in category two are the things that are the most valuable to you long term. These are the things like relationships with your spouse. These are things like social life, um, your personal time. The biggest thing that most of us are robbed from is personal time with ourselves. And so you'll find that the things that will create less stress for you long term are always going to be the things in category two. Because subconsciously, we know the things like spending time with our family and exercising, giving time to ourselves, uh, to cultivating a relationship with your children. Like these things, we know that they're super, super, super important but we make them not urgent. It's just the way the human brain's hardwired. 
because we live in a world where everything's get it done now, instant gratification, instant satisfaction, and we want it like this. And a lot of times we justify putting those important things on the back burner in order to accomplish all the stuff that we know we need to get done with the deadlines. Savvy? Okay. So you'll find though, when you start looking at these categories, it becomes very, very evident why a lot of people are sick in our country. Because when you start looking at how the body develops disease, as I alluded to earlier, the thing that ends up showing its ugly little face last is the symptoms, right? So let's talk about heart disease for a second. Can we feel an artery clogging in our body? Can we feel, I hope I didn't hit the mic, can we feel um, high blood pressure developing? Or cancer, let's talk about cancer. With cancer, is it possible we could all have a stage four tumor in our body right now and not feel it? Absolutely, because what does cancer feel like? You don't feel it. Most of the times, we don't find terminal cancer like a tumor until it has been growing for seven to 10 years that it becomes large enough, it will even show up on an MRI. Which tells us, so the, the problem has been developing and cultivating and growing this entire time, and now boom, all of a sudden you have the symptoms, all of a sudden it's noticeable, the tip of the iceberg's right above the water. But the whole iceberg's been under there the entire time. So symptoms end up becoming extremely urgent and extremely important when they show themselves. Fair? But the cause, which has been underlying, is deemed not important and, for most people, not urgent. They're the things that we really should be doing on a day-in, day-out basis, like exercising and eating really well and taking care of our spine and nervous system and coping with and dealing with stress effectively. So that's why I put this up here. But the cure, when you really start getting into this Covey's quadrants, it's kind of hard to explain it all now with you guys today, but the cure ends up being put more of your activities and more of your time that you're focusing on accomplishing those activities on that quadrant, quadrant number two. And so the things that fall in quadrant number two are things where, dang, I missed the slide in here, but they're, they're important things. It's um, time with your family, it's cultivating relationships. Raise your hand if you've got something else you think is important. Come on, shout it out. What are, what are more important than family to you guys? Yourself, Yourself? okay, what else do we have? Think about it. Come on, your health. <laughs> so you said time with yourself, so that's kind of part of it, but your health, I mean, planning ahead. Like how often do we screw ourselves over, for lack of better terms, because we didn't plan ahead? Like think about your lunch. Do you pack yourself lunch? Do you think about your meal planning ahead of time? What about working out? The three reasons most people don't work out, and the number one reason is because I don't have what? I don't have time to work out. Um, I'm more than happy to come and speak to you guys about this again, teach you how you can work out in 12 minutes, and hormonally get the same benefits as if you went to the gym for an hour. So a lot of times the excuses that we make aren't really relevant or warranted excuses. Um, we just make it because it makes us feel better. It allows us to justify not doing what we know we we're supposed to do. So in order to offset that, my strategy for you guys that I wanna share with you are two things first. Number one, we have to define our lives. What does that mean? Like a cat, you have nine lives. So define what are your nine important lives, or maybe it's six important lives. And what I mean by that is all the hats that you wear. So you go to work, you have a work life. You go home, you have a home life. You have time with your spouse, you have a interpersonal relationship life. You have time at the gym, you have your gym life or your athletic life. And so start defining what are your important lives. Because a lot of times what we end up doing is just like mesh it all together and we just call it life. And because of that, then it all just is a blur. And we're not very specific with how we devote our time and our energy. Number two is I want for you guys to start painting solid yellow lines. So when you're driving a vehicle on the road, if there's hashed yellow lines in the middle, you can cross it, right? If there's double solid yellow lines, what is the rule on the road? Do not, Do not cross those lines. Because if you cross those lines, what happens? Yes, you could get killed, there is danger, you're not supposed to do it. 
So what we end up doing with our time when we don't clearly define our lives and keep our time and focus and energy directly on that life when we're doing that time is we cross the yellow lines and then we get into danger zone. And that's where a lot of stress really comes from. So here's an example of defining our lives. Like a cat, cats have nine lives. You guys are gonna start being kitty cats. Let me hear your best meow. <laughs> Nobody meowed. Come on, it's fun. Meow, meow. Okay, no, okay. So you've got your family life, your personal health and fitness life, your financial life. Yes, that's an important one. A lot of us end up ruining our finances because we just don't take the time to focus only on finances and nothing else. You've got your purpose life. What is the purpose? Why are you here? Are you an airplane sitting on the ground rusting? Were you designed to fly in the air, but you haven't been flying in the air because you haven't been devoting time to your personal life? And so like an airplane, when it's not in the air like it's been designed to be, it sits on the ground, it rusts. Recreational life, your relationship life with your friends and coworkers. You could call that your social life, which I don't know what the social and recreational life would be difference. Recreational things, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Somebody was with me on that. <laughs> So you define your lives. And then the best way to do this is in Maximize Living, we have a thing called war plan. So we war plan our time. My time was war plan today. Um, actually, inaccurately, I thought I was supposed to be here at 1230. So it did kind of cause me a little bit of stress. But I got here at noon, and I've, I'm here speaking to you guys. But on my war plan at 1230, it said Quorum Health Solutions, and it's purpose life and professional life. Because it's purpose life for me, because my purpose is to help people live a healthier life. And if I can teach you guys how to manage and deal with time and stress, then I know I'm accomplishing that portion of my life. And then it's also the solid yellow line for me for business life, because here I am representing Stronghold Chiropractic and Maximize Living. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, if I was sitting up here talking to you guys right now, and I was thinking about an issue that I've got with my girlfriend, would I be more or less effective? less effective, would I have more or less stress? I would have more stress. So I'd be crossing my solid yellow lines if this time is defined for me to be here, now living my purpose and my work life and my professional life, then I am effective. And when I'm effective, I'm successful. Which brings me to another thing, I'll, I'll just throw this tidbit in there, what is your definition of success? A lot of times people get stressed because we end up failing to meet our own defined like definition of success. So a lot of people say, well, in order to be successful, I have to make $200 million. Or in order to be successful, I have to do this, this, and this. What if your definition of success was, you show up, you give it 100% for what you're doing right there in the moment now, and you do not quit? Would you feel more successful? I mean, because it's a little bit less specific and more general, and it makes it easier for you to accomplish it, yeah? Like, how many times have you given something your absolute focus and 100%? We do it more often than we think we do. You're more successful than you really think you are, um, if you adopt that as your definition of success. So, solid yellow line, 7 a.m. to 7, 10 a.m., fitness life. I'm gonna surge train. That's the exercise I was telling you guys about where you can exercise in a very short window of time and still get the same benefits. So there you go, that's my work plan. I'm surge training, 7 to 7, 10 a.m. When 7, 10 is done, I am no longer defined by those solid yellow lines of working out. That's my workout life. Done, I'm done with it. For the rest of the day, I don't think about it again. Then, there you go, nine to 1 p.m., for instance. Let's say I'm a banker. I could say it's my financial life, but that would also be my professional life if I'm a banker. But if I'm not a banker, this is a Saturday schedule for me. From nine to one, I'm working on all my finances. I'm paying my bills, I'm looking at how much I brought in that, that week, how much expenses were, the profit, the loss, and I'm putting it all together and my focus is on nothing else. It would be like you have all of these little sheets on your desk in front of you and they're all different things that have to get done and you sit there and you look at your desk and it's all just like right in front of your face. You would never get any of it done. You have to literally take it all, stack it, move everything else out of the way and then just, just focusing on this right now. Fair? Okay. And we can keep going through this as an example, but these are the solid yellow lines. So like when I'm having date time with my girlfriend, it is date time, I put my cell phone away, I'm not distracted by Facebook, none of that other stuff. 
and you get quality time with what you're doing, with who you're spending that time with. Cool? Who's, who's experienced this before? Maybe you didn't call it solid yellow lines. You've tried this strategy before. Anybody? No? Man, you guys have been missing out. <laughs> so if you walk away with one thing today, it's solid yellow lines. Everybody say it's solid yellow lines. Can you cross solid yellow lines? No. Do solid yellow lines keep you safe? Let's think about this the other way. Yeah, because if there's somebody driving on the other side of the road, if they're going to follow the rules too, they're not going to cross those lines. The solid yellow lines keep me safe in my lane. But when I go out of the solid yellow lines, not only am I a danger to myself, now I become a danger to other people. What if you, you have employees that are working for you, underneath of you, and now you're not following your solid yellow lines and now you're super stressed because you're super stressed, the gas response is taking place in your body, and you are super ineffective. How's that fair to the people that are working for you? It's not, right? So you, became, you become a danger to yourself and then a danger to other people as well. So we'll keep going through. You got financial life, boom, family life, and it's just an example of how we would go about defining our yellow, solid yellow lines. So some examples of this, I could do like skill sharpening could be a life that I define. Maybe I want to work on myself and I just want to get better, so I devote time to read a book every day. Like how is it possible that some of my mentors read 52 books a year? It blows my mind. But like one of my mentors, Dr. Ben Lerner, the guy reads a book every single week, and I'm like, how do you have time to do that? And then on top of that, run five different corporations, and then on top of that, be a chiropractor in your own clinic and adjust patients, and on top of that, have four kids. <laughs> and on top of that, write a book. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't have any kids, I'm not married. I own a business, but like, my God, I could never imagine accomplishing all those things. And he told me the only way that it ever happened was because he defined his lives and he never crosses his solid yellow lines. So when he spends 15 minutes doing that one thing, writing his book, he does 15 minutes of it every day. He's more effective than me trying to write my book, not having solid yellow lines and spending all day on it. How many times have we sat down to go do something and we're so distracted with everything else we don't get it done? Or we get like very little done. I'm like, man, how the hell did I just spend like all afternoon on this thing? Like I just got these, um, so I got a new uh, Cherokee Trailblazer. Beautiful car, I love it. It's like my baby right now. Technically it's not, I've got a dog. That dog is my baby. Um, but it's, it's like my new toy, so I'm super excited about it, and it's a 2016 model, and they don't have HID headlights in it. It's just like the old school, yellow, really faint, crappy headlights. But everything else on the car is amazing, so I bought these HID headlights that I'm going to put in. I still haven't gotten the crap done because I haven't put it in my warplane. I've been sitting there looking at the box every time I come home into my kitchen. It's been there for weeks. And I'm like, that's it. I'm done with it. I'm putting it on my war plan. I'm going to go get it done. And Saturday, I'm just going to devote an hour, and I'll get it done. <clears throat> so that's all I really have for you guys in terms of time management and dealing with stress. But I promise if you take that and you start to apply it this week, what I encourage you to do is this. Take Covey's Quadrants. Print out. Go online. You can print out a blank version of them where it just has one, two, three, and four for the quadrants. And then you can also print out like a pretty detailed definition of how you categorize what your to-dos are. And then what I want for you guys to do is every single day, print out five of them. You can do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Each day, all of your activities you write out in your activity list, categorize them at the end of the day. And then at the end of the week, look at the summary of that and all of your activities you have to do. Try and take some of the things that are in category three and move them to category two. Or instead, try and take time that you're devoting to accomplishing things in Category 3 and figure out how you can take some of the time that you're spending on all those things that really aren't important but to you are urgent and then divert that time and focus and energy to the things that are in Category 2. Fair? And then the other thing I want for you guys to do, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, maybe you'll do it, maybe you won't, I think the people that want to be successful will definitely hear me out on this. I want for you to write down all of your lives, right? So define your lives 
And then, I mean all of them, like TV life. I watch TV. Um, Facebook life. I, I surf Facebook. All the things that you do in terms of activities on a daily basis. In fact, do it on a weekly basis. So just list them all out. Then, since time is our ally if we utilize it properly, how many hours are in a day? How many days are in a week? What's 7 times 24? Come on, you mathematical whizzes. What is it? Yeah. So it's 168 hours that you have allotted as time that is available to you, you can utilize for any given week. What I want for you to do is I want you to take all the activities, list them all out, and then I want you to think about, on average, the past month, how many hours a week do you spend sleeping? How many hours a week do you spend watching TV? How many hours a week do you spend at work? And then just categorize all of it, and then I want you to add up all of your hours. Now, if your hours are more than 168, you are overbooking yourself. You are spending way too much time on activities that are in category three, and you are wasting your time and stressing yourself out unnecessarily. If you add up all your hours and it's significantly less than 168 hours, you're not accounting for all of your time and you're wasting your time because you don't even know what you're doing with your time. <laughs> um, but it's a very effective way of kind of gauging where you're at and how you've been devoting your time and energy on different activities.